Hi, I am Marissa Reckman, CEO at Agit Labs. As a key founding partner of the Agit Foundation, we are pleased to be able to bring you this presentation today on the dangers of opioids and the fentanyl crisis. This is something that is near and dear to my own heart because I know firsthand just how powerful these substances are. I understand how this can affect a family and how it can rip so many apart. In fact, I have seen the loss of a loved one in my extended family due to a fentanyl overdose right here in Calgary, Alberta. So I hope that our commitment to bringing you this presentation really can save lives. This presentation is going to be brought to you today by Dr. Eric Heidman, Dr. Monty Ghosh, and Detective Derek Coffin. They are gonna give you a real world example of what goes on right here in the streets of Calgary and across Canada while combining that with a medical assessment of what opioids and fentanyls can do to you, where they should be used and where they absolutely shouldn't. The Agate Foundation is committed to educational opportunities to ensure that through science, innovation, and technology, we can address the challenges that our communities are facing. And right now, nothing is more important than this one. We are focused on making sure that we give you access to top level experts in their fields so that you can make good decisions for your own life because life is worth living and life is worth experiencing. So we hope that you are able to take part. We hope that you share this information with your own loved ones. And if you have questions and are seeking more answers, we are always here to help. We are going to be broadcasting this to you from the Michael DeSanti Center of Excellence. This auditorium has been built through the Agate Foundation to be used for situations like these. Again, to bring together leading edge expertise on a variety of issues and bring together the information that can help our own communities. So we thank you for tuning in. We hope that you learn much more than you came here with. And we hope that you will listen to the experts that are here to talk to you today. Thank you. So it's a real honor for me to be here today uh, on behalf of the Agate Foundation. Uh, we have uh, three speakers. Uh, I'm Dr. Eric Hyman, I'm a urologist, uh, and I'm gonna talk about opioids and how we're using them in surgery and in the uh, healthcare uh, in Alberta Health Services. We have uh, Dr. Monty uh, Ghosh, who is an internal medicine uh, specialist and has a subspecialty in uh, addiction medicine. And then Derek uh, Coffin, who's a detective in the Calgary Police Service and has uh, a lot of uh, street experience. He's been an undercover officer uh, for approximately seven years. All right, so our, our talk, I'm, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about uh, opioids and where they actually should be used, and that's in surgery and anesthesia. Then we're going to get into a bit more detail on addiction. I have some stories uh, uh, from uh, Dr. Ghosh, where these drugs are made and how they're distributed in the, in the streets. Uh, Derek's going to tell you some uh, very interesting stories regarding that. And then we'll also give you a quick overview uh, about the opioid crisis in Alberta. So when we talk about the opioids, there's a whole class of drugs uh, that are involved here. Uh, and you're going to be familiar with many of these, codeine, morphine, codeine's in Tylenol 3, it's for cough syrups, but it's a, a opioid derivative. Uh, morphine, a very common one. Demerol is one we used to use a lot in the, in the past. It's uh, essentially gone out of use in the medical system. Heroin, everybody has heard about, a very uh, common uh, drug in the 80s and 90s, and that was uh, injected. Then we get into the more synthetic and more modern opioids. Hydromorphone, uh, we certainly do use in the healthcare system. Fentanyl is a very potent, uh, a very short-acting opioid. And then carfentanyl is a veterinarian drug uh, that I'll, I'll address very quickly. Um, so the medical uses of opioids uh, in the hospital, uh, it, it is used a lot for palliative care or cancer pain. If, if there's a, a, a malignancy that is invading uh, into the bones or other structures, then these patients do require a lot of uh, opioids. Uh, acute injuries is something you're going to be all be familiar with. If you fracture your arm on the playground 
or break your ankle. And in the soccer field, obviously that's going to hurt a lot and these medications can be used in, in that situation. They are not ideal for chronic use, uh, for chronic pain. Generally, we have other strategies to deal with that uh, in our healthcare system. And they, uh, in light of that, they should not be taken on a regular basis. So one area that we do use it very frequently and every day, every day I use it would be within surgery. Uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit here. So laparoscopic surgery is where you operate with chopsticks, where you have open surgery, you make an incision in the patient, and often this is to take out bad things or evil humors, I like to call them, cancers, uh, just to help, help uh, the patient. And sometimes we can cure those. Robotic surgery is another way. Any of these procedures are, would cause a lot of pain, and we use opioids in this to make sure that the patient doesn't feel any pain. So I'll show you a very quick uh, uh, video here. Uh, you, you can imagine uh, if a patient were awake and not under anesthetic, how much this would hurt. This is a large uh, tumor that has been incised. The patient isn't moving. They're still using cautery to stop any bleeding. That's the electricity up at the top there, that little blue stick. Uh, very large incision. Again, patient's completely comfortable because we've got these very powerful medications that, that uh, we can use. So the, the question is, if I'm doing these surgeries, whether it's laparoscopic, robotic, or open, we need anesthesia. So uh, these are drugs with opioids and other medications and breathing apparatuses to make sure that the patients don't move during the surgery. They do not feel, feel pain, uh, and, and we're breathing for them. So when we give them these medications or the opioids, it suppresses their respiratory system. And because we have uh, a, a anesthetic machine, a breathing machine, they're okay. If that's not there and they were on these drugs, they wouldn't breathe and, and they wouldn't make it through the, the surgery. So just a little bit more uh, about the history of some of these medications. Uh, uh, fentanyl was uh, made by Janssen Pharmaceutical. This is now a huge pharmaceutical uh, company. Uh, it was originally back uh, in the late 50s uh, and that has now, now evolved um, military use of, of fentanyl. You can see this lollipop, lollipop uh, stick uh, on the side there with a relatively large dose of fentanyl. And the idea is if a soldier were to get injured on the field, they can pop the lollipop uh, in their mouth. However, if they, they got too much medication, started to become too sleepy, then it falls out. So it's sort of a self-regulating way that the, uh, the wounded soldier can deal with uh, their, their injuries. Back in 2002, uh, during the Chechen uh, terrorist situation, the Russian Special Forces actually used an analog of fentanyl and sprayed this in, into the, the hostage situation and it put essentially all, all the people uh, to sleep uh, and some of the uh, terrorists more permanently. So it is a very strong and odorless, tasteless narcotic. Okay, and it's about 50 to 100 times more powerful than morphine. Uh, and, and that's fentanyl. Now we take a step back into carfentanil. This is a, a similar drug, it has a similar structure, but it actually was designed to put elephants to sleep uh, with, with veterinarian use. So if you had a dart gun, you need to put an, ele an elephant to sleep. It gives a very small dose and the whole elephant essentially uh, uh, goes to sleep. So put things in perspective, one grain or even less than that could, uh, could easily kill a human being. So these are, are the potency of these drugs that we're dealing with on, on the street. They're, they're exceptionally uh, potent and very small, small quantities um, uh, can, can deliver a, a huge dose. And this does become, it's very important and useful in surgery, but uh, also we're going to talk to uh, the relationship between this, this potency and drugs and, and how they're made, and that, that'll be important later. So I'm going to shift over to uh, Monty now, and he's going to talk to you a little bit more about uh, addiction. Perfect. So my name is Monty Ghosh. I'm an addiction physician here in Calgary as well as in Edmonton, and I'll be talking about the brain science behind addiction. So addiction is defined as a compulsive disorder uh, with, of drug-seeking use despite harmful consequences, and there's four main aspects to this. There's a loss of control with substances, there's compulsion to use these substances. There's constant cravings to use these substances as well. And there's use despite consequences. You know, a common analogy that I use is with food. Food is a great a drug in many respects. You lose control sometimes when you're eating. Uh, you're compulsed to use it. You have cravings to eat. 
uh, that, that sugary sweet that you have, and you use despite the consequences of gaining weight, having diabetes, for example. Um, and these brain changes can be long-lasting and can lead to harmful behaviors in the future. So how does this all work? It works by targeting the brain's reward system and flooding the, cir the circuitry of your brain with what's called dopamine. Dopamine is our rah, 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 feel-good molecule in our brain. It's the, the molecule that's involved with regulating movement, emotion, uh, understanding, cognition, motivation, and feeling pleasure in general. And overstimulation of the system, which rewards our natural behaviors, uh, produces euphoric effects sought by people who abuse drugs and teaches them to repeat this behavior over and over and over again to gain that, that feeling of, of goodness. Um, so an example of this, again, is with food. You can see here that when you, have, uh, when you eat food, you feel pleasure. You get about 1.5 times the upper limit of dopamine released in your brain. And that lasts for about an hour, and you feel good for about an hour. Uh, sex is the same thing. You get two times the upper limit of normal, and it lasts about three to four hours, in which you feel really, really good. Moving on to some other substances, you can see with cocaine, you get three times the upper limit of normal, and that lasts for a few hours. Morphine, about two times the upper limit of normal, and lasts for four to five hours. And nicotine, like a cigarette, is about uh, two times the upper limit of normal, and lasts for about at thir like 30 minutes. But the big one, the big kicker, is amphetamines and methamphetamines. Uh, so crystal meth is another name for this. And if you are using crystal meth, you get 10 times the upper limit of normal than you normally would. Uh, that's five times more than sex. And it lasts sometimes for a full 24 hours of feeling good. So you can understand why, with crystal meth especially, there's nothing in reality that's similar to this and why you feel so addicted to these, com these compounds. To really understand how addiction works on the brain, I want to highlight two parts of the brain. The first part of the brain is your frontal lobe. This is the executive functioning part of the brain. This is the part of the brain that tells us what to do or what not to do. This is part of the brain that tells us to not jump off the ledge of a bridge or to fall off the side of a balcony, for example. This is the part of the brain that tells us right from wrong as well. Uh, the other part of the brain is what's called the mesolimbic system. And this is part of our primitive part of our brain. This part of the brain has existed within our, within our species for, for millennia and other species as well. This is the part of the brain that rewards us for eating and drinking and for having sex to procreate the species. This part of the brain is most functional as a child. Uh, as a child, if, if you were not to have the mesolimbic system, a baby would not eat or drink, and it would eventually pass away. But this part of the brain keeps the baby function, keeps the baby alive. It tells the baby to keep eating and drinking to keep themselves going. As the baby develops and as they get older, the frontal lobe kicks in more and more and more. And that's kind of why, as adults, we're able to make more decisions, uh, weighing pros and cons from these decisions as well. So again, the frontal lobe takes over the mesolimbic system as we get older, but this system can sometimes get disrupted with addiction. So a uh, classic example of this is, uh, is uh, what we call the desert island analogy. So on a desert island, if you were to get stranded there, your frontal lobe would tell you to create a help sign in the sand. It would tell you to build a raft to get yourself to another island or to seek help. Uh, it would tell you to uh, somehow find other resources to get water off of, such as getting, you know, getting coconuts and drinking coconut water. Um, but as you get more and more thirsty, your mesolimbic system kicks in. It tells you that you need water to survive. It tells you that you need water to keep going. And eventually, your frontal lobe will shut down, and your mesolimbic system will kick in. Now, if I were to appear to you on this island and offer you a glass of water, but in exchange, you'd have to give me your partner, your kids, uh, all your belongings, uh, you would happily trade it over to get water because your mesolimbic system tells you that you need water to survive. And if you don't get it right now, you will not continue on. Um, as soon as I give you the water and as soon as you drink the water, your mesolimbic system gets satisfied, your frontal lobe kicks back in and is like, wait a second, what did I do? Um, and this kind of explains what happens with addiction. With addiction, your mesolimbic system takes over. You need substances. You need drugs to survive. You need drugs to keep going. And as soon as you get those drugs, you realize that you made a mistake, that you realize that, uh, that all that you've done to get those drugs, you know, things such as uh, lying, crime, things like that, uh, were, were all because of that mesolimbic system. You didn't mean to do that, but you were compelled to do that. Addiction, um, there's different phases to this addiction. Some people have a genetic predisposition to having an addiction. Uh, some people need to have, uh, have used a substance to start off with in order to get an addiction. 
Um, so the initial positive effects of, of, of using substances are short-lived. You need more and more just to feel normal over time because as those dopamine levels deplete in your system, you need more to actually feel good. So for example, if you, um, to wake up in the morning and get to work, you have to have a dopamine level of 50 nanograms per deciliter. Uh, if you feel depressed, you're at 40 nanograms per deciliter. And again, as I talked about earlier, if you're using crystal meth, you're at 1,000 nanograms per deciliter. Over time, your levels deplete. And we've done studies that have shown that people who are using substances like crystal meth, opioids on a regular basis, if they were to, uh, if they were to use, again, these drugs on a regular basis, their dopamine levels decrease over time. Uh, before you know it, though, they have uh, 20 nanograms of dopamine in their system, which is well below the level of depression in order to get up and get your day started. Uh, and so they need more drugs just to get their dopamine levels up to a baseline uh, level to get their day going, to actually function properly in society. And so they start to use more and more to avoid the adverse effects of not being on substances as opposed to getting the, uh, the advantageous effects of feeling good from these substances. So I talked about the genetic aspect behind this already, but uh, one thing that we're learning more and more of is that sometimes it's not just genetics, but it's also what people experience in their lives uh, that causes them to use substances. And this is uh, a classic example of that. It's called Adverse Childhood Experiences, or ACE scores. Uh, we've got 11 scores here, and they include abuse, either physical, emotional, or sexual abuse, neglect, either physical or emotional neglect, as well as household dysfunction, including mental illness, an incarcerated relative, a mother or parent who was treated violently, a family history of substance use, or a family history of divorce. So if you have four more of these scores in your early childhood, you're at a higher risk of having adverse experiences down the road, which I'll just go over in a bit. Uh, but there's also another aspect to this as well. There's also what we call resiliency scores. You know, some people have these scores, some people have divorced parents, but they do well in life. And that's because they've developed the resiliency to deal with this, but not everyone has those resiliencies. So if you have four more of these scores, you're at higher risk of having traumatic brain injury, depression, anxiety, unintended pregnancy, HIV or STIs, cancer, diabetes, alcohol, or other substance use, but also social factors such as poor education, uh, low-level occupation, or lack of access to proper occupation, as well as income. So this is a pyramid of addiction. Again, the, these kind of, uh, the more you have of these, the more likely you are to develop addiction in the future. So again, people, about 20% of the population has a baseline genetic predisposition to addiction. Uh, adverse childhood experiences compound this. Um, you develop character, personality, and coping skills to deal with the experiences you've had as a child. Uh, then you get emotional dysregulation. You develop addictive behaviors. And after, before you know it, you develop full-blown addiction. So how do you deal with this? How do you navigate around this? And I talked about those resiliency scores before. And a key piece to resiliency is community supports. Uh, another story that goes behind this is what's called the Rat Park Experiment. So this was an experiment that was done in Quebec, in, Ca in Canada, back in the 70s, in which a scientist took a rat and placed it in a box and gave the rat two drips. One was a water drip in which the, the rat could drink as much water as it wanted. The other was another drip with water, but also with heroin in that drip. And they found that these rats would often, would actually almost all the time preferentially use the heroin drip more than the water drip and would eventually die because they would use the heroin drip so much. The, the next experiment that he did was he used, uh, he put these rats, same types of rats, into what was called rat park. So this was a giant park in which there was games, there was food, uh, the rat could participate in activities with other rats, and they also had these two drips. Again, it was the water drip and the heroin drip, and they found that the rats preferentially used the water drip, and only 10% of the rats stuck to the heroin drip. Uh, and so this goes to show that with proper social supports and social structure that uh, addiction can be minimized. So how does this work in the human world? A classic example of this is the Vietnam War. So um, in the Vietnam War, we had thousands of U.S. soldiers who went to Vietnam who were fighting a war, who were traumatized from the war, seeing death, destruction everywhere they went. Um, and a lot of them had addictions to opioids. Uh, opium in particular, so this is the, the natural form of, of opioids, and uh, it was cheaper to get opium than it was to even get cigarettes in Vietnam during this time period. And so there was this big fear in the United States that when these war vets came home, that they would be, a high, they would be at a high risk of having a continued addiction in, in the United States. But what they found was that these individuals, when they returned home, despite all the trauma that they faced in Vietnam, 
were okay. Less than 10% of them to 20% were still using uh, we were still using drugs. The rest of them came off of their opium that they were addicted to. And this was, when they looked into this, this was because they were back in their home environment, back with their families, back in a supportive structure. And, uh, and the thought process was, was that if we were supporting these individuals as a community, as if we put ourselves around them as a community, wrapped ourselves around them as a community, they would do well. Um, with that, I will uh, pass the conversation on to, uh, to Derek. I'd like to thank my uh, co-presenters as well as the Agate Foundation for giving this opportunity to speak about a, um, a topic that's uh, very near and dear to me and I'm passionate about, uh, which is um, street drug use and, um, and all the things uh, that go around that. Uh, I'm Derek Coffin. I've been with the Calgary City, uh, Calgary City Police uh, Service for 15 years. Uh, in those 15 years, I've been fortunate enough that I was uh, in a two-year uh, surveillance unit where we primarily focused on surveillance of uh, drug dealers uh, and then um, uh, taking down their houses. And then after that, I was able to uh, join the drug unit uh, for almost five and a half, close to six years, uh, where I was uh, undercover, had big long hair and a big beard, and I got to buy um, uh, drugs in an undercover capacity. Uh, and that's where I really got my passion for, for this subject. Um, today, although we're talking about fentanyl, I want to make it perfectly clear that I am uh, opposed to any sort of drug use, uh, you know, uh, street drug, drug use. Um, some of the stuff I'm going to talk about, some of the things I'm going to uh, mention, um, is for those who are using our, our drugs and are addicted to those drugs. But for everybody else that hasn't tried, do not try drugs. I don't support it at all. Um, so today we're talking about fentanyl, but uh, in Calgary when I first started, uh, crack cocaine was one of the predominant uh, street drugs. Uh, crack cocaine moved out, fentanyl and methamphetamine is now uh, some of the, the bigger drugs in Calgary that are destroying lives. I'm going to start with just a few quotes um, of uh, people that have used uh, drug users that have become addicts. Um, and just to just tell you, kind of describe the power uh, of these drugs and, and how difficult it is for these drug users and people that are addicted to get off them. Uh, so the first one is you crush a line and slowly inhale the powder. You get a dull old smell in your nose. About well, five minutes later, a warmth starts to radiate from the center of your chest like fresh heated blankets that, uh, that have been placed on you. Okay, now just imagine that you are living on the street. Uh, you have uh, no friends. Uh, you have no family support. Uh, you fighting for your food, you can you know, you're just trying to stay warm, and this drug gives you the pleasure to get through the day. This is how you function. This is how you get through. This is the only thing that you can get through the day. Okay. And next quote is your your head vibes with pleasure and euphoria, a feeling that can only be described as continuous sexual climax within your brain. Your muscles relax. Your body slumps downwards in the most relaxed, blissful state known to man. I don't think anybody, uh, when they start using these drugs, wants to become an addict. Nobody wants to become an addict. Nobody wants to live on the street, but these drugs are so powerful. That's why you don't ever want to start. Okay? Your eyes begin to close and you enter a state of half consciousness, lucid dreaming almost. Your body just pulses and radiates with pleasure. Okay, these are the feelings that uh, a lot of these drug, uh, and these are only three quotes. There's, there's more uh, stories out there of these drug, uh, drug users uh, who have become addicted and just can't get off it because this is how they get through their day. Now, street level fentanyl uh, is, is different than the fentanyl that you're buying in the far, from a pharmaceutical or that a doctor is going to use uh, in surgery or people that uh, use it in palliative care. Uh, they're getting an exact amount of dosage. So your average fentanyl pill that we used to see uh, used to be about 0.3 grams. On the street, we don't see as many pills now. We see it in baggies, and I'll explain that, the reasons for that. But fentanyl uh, is now uh, mixed with all sorts of different uh, agents to make it a little bit more bulky when they sell it. Because just a tiny, tiny bit of fentanyl can kill. And even a smaller dose of carfentanyl is lethal. As we can see from these numbers, uh, a pill is about $20. Now, I'm going to tell you a little story about a, a young man that I, I ended up arresting. 
uh, about how about these pills, about fentanyl. So this is this is quite early on when they were still when uh, fentanyl was being s still sold in pill form. I ended up arresting this young man, and and he told me that when he first started uh, on uh, using fentanyl, he was at a bar with his buddy, and he had a toothache, so he was going to go home. And his friends like, "Don't go home. We're having a great time. Just take half. Just take this pill, but only half, and it'll get rid of your toothache. And let's keep partying." So when I caught up to him, he had a six pill a day habit, $120 a day uh, on st street level of drugs. I mean, no, no doctor was going to give it to him. And he didn't know where it had gone from a half a pill to suddenly his girlfriend's leaving and moving away to the point where he doesn't have the energy to get out of bed and go to work. So he's phoning in and uh, sick, loses his job, making no money, and now he's up to six pills a day. So of course the, the drug dealer, uh, um, his, his, his boss, uh, is now using him to sell drugs to other users to support his habit. $120 a day is how much he was spending on his drug habit. And so he has to sell that many drugs to make up for that habit. When we first started seeing fentanyl in Calgary, it was in, it was in the green pill, the CDN and AD on the back. Uh, in fact, one of my first, uh, uh, I was one of the first undercover operators to buy uh, fentanyl in Calgary. And when he, when he first, uh, I remember jumping into the car, he, uh, I, I go to buy the pill and he, and he hands it back to me and he asks me to test. And I, and I see this green, green pill for the very first time. And I, we just figure it's like a Oxycontin or a different kind of opioid um, with the same effects. We did not have any idea how addictive this thing was. So I couldn't talk my way out of uh, testing, so he ended up kicking me out of the car. But we ended up following him away and, and arresting him, and he ended up having 150 of these pills. At the time, we had no idea uh, uh, the, the extent that Calgary would be taken over by these pills. Now, as the demand grew in Calgary, we went from the pharmaceutical, there just wasn't enough that people started uh, ordering in the fentanyl and making it themselves. Now, originally, because they wanted, everybody wanted the pills, and that's what they would ask for, that's what the, the, the clients expected, uh, if they couldn't get enough, they would start making it themselves. Now, the powder itself is orderless. Uh, they can add now, it, it, they can add different colors. They can add purple or pink, or and they color code it to tell you, oh, this is the this is the the good stuff. It's a little the purple stuff's a little harder than the pink stuff, uh, or the white stuff is a little bit more high grade than the uh, than the the orange stuff. But it's all the same. It's just how they want to sell it, how they want to package it. Uh, it looks like it might look like heroin, it might look like cocaine, um, but it's far far more deadly. Now, the reason we are never, ever, ever going to police our way out of this problem is that fentanyl and you know, most, almost all drugs, the profit margins are far, far too high. So a lot of people go online and they can order this from pharmaceutical countries overseas. Uh, uh, China, uh, Southeast Asia, well, the pharmaceuticals will produce them and they'll send them over. Now, we do a good job intercepting a lot of them, but they can buy it online for about 12500 US currently on the internet. Now, when they get here, they can sell it to the drug dealers for about 28000 I mean, it's obviously, it's fluctuating. But we're talking at $260,000 uh, $260, potential profit for people that can get this drug into the country. Now, what does the drug dealer turn around? He takes this kilo of, of fentanyl, and he can make it into pills. Now, traditionally, they used to make it into pills. Now, they've, they've gotten rid of that, and they're just making it into, into little baggies. About the same weight, though. And they sell it for about the same price. So they get the kilo in, and they start mixing it up. And they mix it with all sorts of other, um, uh, other components to make, uh, to make their fentanyl bags. Now, at $20 a pill, that one kilo can make one million pills, so $20 million. That's almost $20 million of profit. I mean, really, your 12500 seems inconsequential now. I mean, $20 million from your $12,000 investment. We are not, as a police service, able to compete with this 
somebody is willing to take the risk of being arrested, put in jail, to make that kind of money. So in an effort for the, you know, for the police to try to stop or slow down uh, the, the making and the selling of these drugs, we make new laws. For example, the pill press. Uh, the pill press, they used to, uh, you know, uh, have these shipped into uh, different parts of Canada where they were, were making the pills. Now, these pill, these pill presses can make 10,000, 18,000 tablets per hour. Uh, so the drug dealers aren't going to stop making drugs. They just adapt. They're actually way better at adapting than we are. We make a new law, they adapt, so... Instead of now selling it in pill form, they're just selling it in baggy form. So, again, we're not going to be able to make laws or police our way out of this problem. When pharmaceutical companies make drugs, when they, they make them with precision, when, you, when a doctor decides that he wants to give his patient some uh, drugs, a certain kind of drugs, let's say fentanyl, be it for palliative care or for an operation. He's done calculations, you know, weight, uh, size of the person, how long he needs them under, uh, all that kind of stuff. So then they get the exact, the pharmaceutical company then makes exact amount of fentanyl or whatever drug they need. And that's the laboratory. Nice, clean, perfect lab. Now on the right-hand side, we see what your typical lab looks like. And this is actually a picture that was taken in Calgary. This is a, the fentanyl lab. This is them breaking down and making uh, your, your street-level drugs. There's no precision here. They're just grabbing the, the, the drugs they have, they're, they're adding their filler, they're mixing it up, and then they're starting to bag it. There is no, there's no calculations here. The testing they do is when they give it to their clients. Uh, I was, in fact, I was... Um, I remember I was, uh, was jumped into a car once and I was buying fentanyl from, from uh, one of the dealers. And so I bought off him a couple times and I jumped into a vehicle with him and, and, he, and we do one for a little drive and he stopped and he says, okay, now this one I'm giving you today, he said it is so much stronger than my last batch. He said my girlfriend last night, she ended up overdosed and almost died. And she, and she can take a lot of fentanyl. She said, so be careful, maybe take about half as much as you usually do. So here's a guy I jumped into the vehicle with his girlfriend almost died from a fentanyl overdose the day before, but he was almost kind of bragging by saying, hey, listen, this is the good stuff, so you only need to take half of it. I'm charging you the same price, and you only need to take half of it. So when you're buying street-level drugs, you have absolutely no idea what you're getting. I mean, the dealers don't even know what they're getting. And he tested it on his girlfriend. And it was only the fact that she overdosed and he knew how much she could take that he knew that it was a stronger batch. So when you're buying fentanyl on, on the street or any drug for that matter, you really have no idea what you're getting. Like I said, the dealers don't even know what they're getting. I mean, if their clients give them feedback, hey man, this stuff is really strong, hey, this is the good stuff, hey, uh, you know, you gave me some weak stuff. I mean, I was listening to the lines one day uh, which is when we had tapped a uh, drug dealer's phone, and he was talking about, uh, he was complaining because his clients were phoning him back and saying, hey, this is weak stuff. You ripped me off. I want my money back. So he's going back to his supplier saying, hey, I want my money back because you gave me some really bad, weak drugs. So, I mean, they don't even know what they're getting half the time. And when you're dealing with this, it's like, as we can see, this is like a mint. Uh, but I'll use a chocolate chip. Uh, chocolate chip analogy. When your mom goes and your mom or dad makes you chocolate chip cookies and you bite into that first chocolate, you pick out your chocolate out of the, out of the jar, sometimes uh, you get really lucky and there's like eight or nine chocolate chips in there. And then the next uh, chocolate, the chocolate cookie you pull out, it only had four chocolate chips in it. In fact, sometimes you get really mad because you look over and your, your brother or sister has you know, eight or nine chocolate chips in theirs and you look at yours and you're like, well, I only got three or four. I'm going to have to take another cookie. That's much like the drug dealers and their drugs. You don't know how much you're getting in each, in each hit that you're taking. Okay? This is why it's so, so dangerous to take street-level drugs. From your doctor, much, much different. But when you're looking at street-level drugs, you never know what you're getting. This is a good example of, 
of sort of this kind of really clarifies it. So the crystals, the, the bluish crystals, that let's say that's your fentanyl. And the white's your filler. Okay, and there's going to be more filler in everything. And carfentanyl, imagine that's it's 100 times more powerful than fentanyl. So you have a lot more filler in there. So the first time you're, you're, you're a user and you, your first hit is the left hand, where there's only like three or four little crystals in there. And you take it and you're like, nah, I didn't get that, that feeling that I wanted. So then you go to your second bag and you pop it open and you take your next hit and you get the right hand. And it's got way, way too much in it. And then you're dead. And this isn't just in fentanyl. I want to tell you a story about when I was, uh, when we were working and we were uh, doing a operation on an MDM, MDMA dealer, which is ecstasy. It's the, the party drug. And so MDMA, it uh, gives you a really uh, nice euphoric feeling inside, makes you feel really good. Uh, your skin is really, you know, just touching your skin feels good. Water tastes better. Uh, but it starts to heat your body. The problem is, is that MDMA starts to heat up your body. So you need to cool yourself down. Now, MDMA was very, very difficult to get. So the creative drug dealers, they decided the best thing to do is, is to start using this other uh, additive, PMMA. Now, the problem with PMMA is that it gives you about half the good feeling. So the feeling inside of you is only about half. But the problem is, is that it, the, the heat inside your body was twice as much. So people would take these, these pills and they would only get half the feeling they were expecting, so they'd take another pill. Now there's four times the heat inside their body. We had 18 deaths and it was the blood in their brains were boiling. We found people with their heads in snowbanks trying to cool themselves off. And it was all just because the drug dealers were trying to find new and creative ways to sell drugs to their clients. And it ended up that we ended up with, I can't even remember, 18 to 20 deaths of people who had actually fried their brains. So it's not just fentanyl, it's all street drugs. Now I'd like to talk to you uh, today a little bit about the pill part, pill party, uh, or skittle party. So some of you have, may have been to these. Uh, most of you probably know about them. And it's about parties where you go there with your friends, somebody's parents are out of town, you get a bowl, and everybody brings drugs from their own house. And they just, from grandma's uh, pharmaceuticals, mom, dad's pharmaceuticals, grandpa's pharmaceuticals, put them into a, a bowl, and then everybody just takes one. This is much like playing Russian roulette. Most of those drugs in there probably will have little or no effect to you. Maybe make your heart race a little, a little more, maybe give you a little bit of, um, you know, painkiller, maybe like a Tylenol. Absolutely not sure what you're getting. Maybe, maybe, maybe one is just a blood thinner. But one in there could be grandma who is on palliative care because she has terminal cancer. And grandma's been taking fentanyl for quite some time now. So of course, she's, her body's more used to it. So she needs more and more fentanyl to give her the same pain killing. Now you take that dosage and you're dead. Okay? You take that pill and you're dead. Your friend sees grandma taking it, and grandma's fine. She, she takes this pill, and she just feels, she looks like she feels better. But you take this pill, and you're dead. Now, if you're going to go to the, the party, and you're going to take that pill, then you don't need to think about it. You don't need to think about, you know, going to that party, because you're going to take that pill. If you're going to say no, if you want to say no, if you do not want to take drugs, start thinking about it now. Because the party, it's too late. Believe me, at the party, it is far, far, far too late. Your friends are going to be there. The girls are going to be there. The boys are going to be there. They're all going to be looking at you. And you're going to be like, no, I'm not going to do it. It's too late. So if you want to say no, think of your reasons now. And that's important. I'm going to be showing you some slides, and although they're dated, I think the, uh, they're as meaningful today as they were when the slides were made. In fact, in some cases, even more meaningful. In 2015, more deaths were attributed to fentanyl than traffic collisions and homicides combined. I mean, now in, in 2020 with the pandemic, we've seen 
a fentanyl overdoses and deaths skyrocket. They've, they've, they've peaked. I mean, and they don't seem to be slowing down. And for whatever, we don't even know all the contributing uh, factors. But fentanyl is real. And it's killing more people today than it did even in 2015, when we thought it was out of control. Now, fentanyl is 40, 40 times more toxic than heroin and 100 times more toxic than morphine. And we know that carfentanil is 100 times more toxic than fentanyl. So these are the two, and we don't even know what drugs are coming out next. I mean, carfentanil, fentanyl, uh, there's going to be more uh, deadly drugs coming out, and we won't even know about them until they hit the street and they've started killing people. So we, you have to understand the power of these. I mean, heroin was considered one of the most deadly drugs uh, before these two started coming up. Uh, when you went to court, if you were a heroin dealer, you would serve more time for dealing heroin than any other drug. Now fentanyl, you're serving as, if you deal fentanyl, you're going to be do, doing more time than even heroin dealers. Okay? So these are very, very powerful, deadly drugs. Now in a, in a, in a, in a hospital setting or you know, with a doctor, uh, giving these drugs is one thing. But street drugs, drugs are completely different. Now it's important, the next one, two out of three, of, or two-thirds of fentanyl deaths in Calgary happen in suburban communities. It's important for everybody to realize that this is not a downtown problem. This is not a homeless problem. This is not a down-on-your-luck uh, problem. This is everybody's problem. This is a young person's problem, an old person's problem, a working per person's problem, moms, dads, grandmas, grandpas, everybody. When I was out uh, doing surveillance and I would watch the drug dealers, these drug dealers, uh, de uh, deal drugs, I would see 15, 16 year olds buying these drugs. I would see middle aged men and women buying these drugs. I would see older people, 60, 70, buying these drugs. This is a drug that is sweeping across not only Calgary, Alberta, Canada, and the world. Easily regrettable. So much profit for the drug dealers in this drug. This is not your downtown homeless issue. This is an issue across all of Canada. The next one, a deadly dose of fentanyl is two milligrams, which is equal to just two grains of salt. Now, car fentanyl is even less, as we, as we know that car fentanyl is far more powerful. Two grains of salt. Don't use these drugs from the street. Don't use these drugs. If you do, two grains of salt will kill you. Okay? 40% of bank robberies this summer, okay, this is probably about a 2015 stat, uh, were linked to fentanyl addictions. I mean, for sure that's, that's going to be the same number. Okay? Addic when you're addicted to something, as we know, you'll do anything for it. These people are not bank robbers. They're not doing it to become rich, uh, to move off to you know, uh, Mexico with all their money like we see in the movies. These are people that are robbing banks to feed their addiction. These people will steal from their, their mothers, their grandmothers, their fathers, their friends, anything they can get money, any way they can get money to feed that habit. It all consuming. And to think that you're going to be able to take these drugs once and, and you'll be able to feel that feeling and never want to do it again, give your head a shake. Because that's not how it works. The drugs take you over. And just one single use, just using it for one single time, you could become an addict. Again, you may think your friend is sleeping, but they're actually ODing. Okay? Again, I do not want anybody to start using these drugs. Not, 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 not street drugs. I mean, pharmaceutical and from your doctor is one thing. I don't want anybody to, to take and use these drugs. But I know for a fact that statistically some of you are going to use it. Some of you guys are going to try it. Some of you guys are going to make that conscious decision to try this drug. Some of, them, some of you guys are going to try it with your friends. There was a young boy that I knew that he went, uh, he had a, a weed dealer 
And uh, so he phoned up his marijuana uh, dealer and, and he didn't have any weed. He said, hey dude, I'm out of, I'm out of weed. So instead he said, but I'll, I'll sell you this pill. You know, it's gonna give you the same effect. It's gonna make you feel good and, and stuff like that. It was fentanyl. One time, one time and dead. Didn't do it with his friends, all by himself. Nobody's there to help him. If you've made that conscious decision to do drugs, to take that fentanyl pill, to put your life at risk, then do it safely, as safe as you can. Come up with a safety plan. Make sure you have your naloxone kit. Make sure you have all those things in place so that when it does happen, and it will happen, it's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when you're gonna overdose. I mean, that's just, I see it too many times in my career where unfortunately, it was that one time that they weren't prepared and then they ended up dead. So please don't use drugs, but if you do, have your safety plan, have your naloxone kit, make sure your friends are with you, don't do it alone, because otherwise you'll just end up dead. Thanks for your time.